Hi there, welcome everybody to our presentation today. My name is Gareth Dyke and I'm head of training at Top Edit Author Services. In our presentation today, we're going to be talking about editing and processing an abstract in English. As I mentioned, Gareth Dyke is my name. I'm a researcher, developer, an academic, author of more than 280 academic peer-reviewed articles. I work as an editor and a journal manager employed by Top Edit Author Services. Thank you so much for tuning in to our presentation today. Thank you so much for joining us. We are going to wait just a few moments to make sure that everybody who wants to join this broadcast has the chance to be with us today, editing and processing an abstract in English. That's the topic of our conversation today. You can see my WeChat QR code down there on the right hand side at the bottom of this first slide. You can feel free to contact me, to contact Top Edit. We are hoping that the contents of this presentation will help you in your journey as an author, as an editor, working on English language abstracts. I'm going to turn off my camera now, but I'll be back at the end of our presentation in order to answer any questions that you may have. We will have lots of time for questions and comments at the end of our session. If you have comments or questions as we get going through this presentation, feel free to write them into the chat and we will be sure to answer them at the end of our presentation today. Okay, editing and processing an abstract in English. We're ready to get started. As I mentioned before, Gareth Dyke is my name. I worked in Ireland, in the UK, now in Hungary. I work with a number of publishing companies as an editor, and I am head of training at Top Edit Author Services. You can feel free, as I mentioned, to get in touch with me, to get in touch with our team. We are here to help you with your editing, with your language, with your English translation services, editing services. Have a look at our website, get in touch with our team. If you would like some more information about how we can help you with your English language, you're probably thinking, what are we going to talk about in our presentation today? We're going to talk about two things. Firstly, the structure of an effective English abstract and then abstract writing tips and tricks, the structure of an effective English abstract, and then how you can more effectively write abstracts in English. Those are the two topics for our presentation today. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you again for listening. Let's begin with abstract structure. Here's Winston Churchill. He was famously said, by JFK, by the American president, John F. Kennedy, to be able to mobilize the English language and send it into battle. We can learn to use language, editing and writing language, English language, to get our message across, to be effective writing, editing and publishing our articles in English. But in the context of abstracts, of course, we now think as the abstract of an academic paper as the window into that article. All of the information needed for the editor, for another reader to understand what's being done, what's being written, the contents of that article in the abstract. But of course, that was not always the case early pieces of academic writing that were not peer reviewed, but that nevertheless appeared in leading international journals did not have the same kind of abstract as we would expect today. And you can see here from one of Charles Darwin's early pieces of published 
writing the abstract actually is more of a letter to the editor. My dear sir, the accompanying papers. He does not do what we expect to see as editors, as authors in an abstract when we read abstracts today. Abstracts in academic articles today provide all of the necessary information for a reader, for an editor, for a peer reviewer to understand what's happening. Why? As you'll see later in this presentation, it is very often the case that people do not read the whole of academic papers. They just read the abstract, they just read the title. So for this reason, it's very important to be effective when you write, when you edit an abstract in English. You'll be aware, I hope, of the general structure of a full academic article. Here it is, the title and the abstract perform one function, whereas the rest of the paper, the main text, the IMRAD academic article structure provides a different function. The title and the abstract, along with the keywords, are important for discoverability, for people to understand quickly and easily what the paper is about. Whereas the rest of the paper, the main text, that's where the meat, that's where the contents, that's where the specific information for people who have a key professional interest in the work will go to find out more information. Your title and your abstract are therefore key in order to get your message across. In the context of academic article writing structure, one of the three key things to know about before you start to write. Structure is so important. Your message, your audience, and your structure, as we'll come back to later, readers need to know throughout an article where they've come from, where they are now, and where they're going. A plot is needed. Academic paper writing, editing, no different from any other kind of creative writing in this respect. That plot, that structure is needed. And in this presentation, in this webinar, we're going to talk about abstract editing, abstract structure. What makes a good quality abstract? It has to be honest, and precise, it has to stand alone. This is often all that people read. So all of the information that people need to have about your study, about your article, has to be there in the abstract. No technical jargon, no references, and never forget, as an author, often the quality of your abstract is what's going to inform your editor's decision. Many journals base their decisions on what to do with submitted articles on the abstract alone. However, many authors write their abstracts in a rush at the end of the process almost as an afterthought. This has to be a concise, standalone piece of writing with a very clear message that accurately reflects the full text of the paper. If you struggle with abstract writing in English, you can do it using the four question technique. Ask yourself these four questions, answer them with information relevant to your own article, and then delete the questions. We do this all the time in our paper writing workshops at Top Edit. Why did you do the study? What did you do? What did you find? And what did you conclude? Why did you do it? You answer that, delete the question. What did you do? Answer that, then delete. The question, what did you find and what did you conclude? This gives an abstract in an academic article, that clear structure that readers need, that editors need, that peer reviewers need to follow and understand what you did. A concise, standalone piece of writing with a very clear message. The other technique that you can use to get an effective abstract written easily is by actually writing a structured abstract. As we've talked about already, I've given you the template, the basic structure for abstract writing, but many journals, as you'll be aware, ask for structured abstracts from authors anyway. They want the background, then the methodology, the principal findings, and then the conclusions and significance. You can do this anyway. 
even if your journal is not asking you for a structured abstract, it's nevertheless a good idea to write one anyway. As we've discussed, using the four question technique, put that structure into your writing. You will help yourself to write and edit the abstract, and you will help your readers to understand what's going on in your study. In science and technology abstracts in particular, in our field, there are three or four key stages to go through, as we've talked about. The object, the method, the result, and the conclusion in that sequence. Check the original nature of your results. Is your study new and interesting? And if so, why? And how does your work relate to a currently hot topic? How can you sell your study to a journal editor and make them think, this is interesting. I'm going to want to send this for peer review. I'm going to want to look at this for potential publication in my journal. Let's have a look at a few quick examples. And you should be able, with a colored marker, with a colored pen, to go into a well-written art abstract. Mark off the four questions. Mark off those four topics on the slide just previously. This one, it tells you what was done. It tells you the question. It tells you why the work was done. It then tells you the results. And then it tells you the conclusions in that sequence. And in this presentation, there are a number of blocks of text, such as the block of text shown here and here about blockchain technology. You can have a look at these later when you review the contents of this presentation, when you re-listen, when you use this presentation in your own work in the future to help you understand the structure of technical abstract writing. Why did you do the work? What did you do? What did you find? And what did you conclude? Those are the key pieces of the structure of effective abstract writing. Here's another example using artificial intelligence. We can go in, we can mark off those four structural questions. Why did you do the study? Artificial intelligence has proven to be superior to human decision making in certain areas. What did you do? I examine an extreme case of the application of AI in the domain of government. What did you find? I conclude that these objections do not successfully derail AI technocracy. And why is the study significant? Read and mark and identify those four questions in the structure of well-written abstracts. So the first one or two sentences give the reader the aim of the study, the state of the art. Here we show the aim of this study is to why was the study done? Then the methods and the results. What did you find? What did you show? What did you do? Second sentence is the methods followed by the results in an abstract as we start to analyze the structure. And then finally, the final sentence states the conclusions of the study. You can go and have a look at recent articles in your own subject area. You can try to identify this kind of structure in the writing. I bet you will find it in well-written, highly cited academic abstracts. The structure is there. The contents is there. Those four questions occur in sequence. And editors actually look for this sequence when they're analyzing the structure of articles that have been submitted to their journals. Top international peer-reviewed impact factor high journals employ professional editors who will go to authors and ask them often to restructure their abstracts so that their abstracts conform to this style of writing. Here's something from my own editing work, grabbing the reader, drawing them immediately to the crucial issue that your paper addresses. And here you can see marked in blue the four questions that are in the structure of this abstract. As I mentioned, have a look at these slides again in your own time when you have this 
recording. And of course, we will give everybody who registers, expresses an interest in this event, this recording. You can look at these pictures, these slides again in the future to help you with the structure of your writing. Here is my favorite paper of all time, one of my favorite pieces of editing work um, that I've done in my career as an editor. Great piece of work. I love it. It's about identifying the ecology of a particular piece of rainforest based on roadkill, based on dead animals found along a particular piece of road. So you can see here several alternative titles that the editors proposed for this paper. And you can think to yourself as an editor, which one of these is going to be best, is going to be most appropriate to get the message of this article across. The first one uses a colon to break up information, something specific, followed by something general. And then the other two are question-based titles. And I actually like these kinds of approaches to title writing in English, short and question-based, so that readers, peer reviewers, are going to think, ooh, that's an interesting question. I'm going to want to read more. I'm potentially going to want to find out more information about this particular piece of work. And here's the abstract. We won't analyze this in detail here in this presentation, but you will be able to easily identify the four questions that I've posed that comprise the structure of a well put together abstract. What did you do? Why did you do it? How did you do it? And what did you conclude? Go in and see if you can identify the different shapes, the different structures seen in these abstract examples. So let's now pause a moment in this presentation and have a look at the purpose and uses of abstracts. We'll look also at the types of abstracts that academic journals use, that academic journals expect to see. We'll also have a quick look at some of the common errors in English writing that authors tend to make. Second or third language English as a second language authors tend to make when putting together abstracts for submission to journals. We'll talk about the writing and the writing process. And we'll also talk a little bit about what differences you might put into your abstract for a presentation, a meeting or a poster, for example. So let's go. Let's go in and have a look then at some aspects of an abstract and what it does. The purpose of an abstract, of course, is to provide an overview of an article, because as we've discussed, readers might not look at anything else. The abstract also provides context for those who don't read the whole article. They're often used by journals to assign reviewers. And of course, they're also used by abstracting and information services to index and retrieve articles. So very important for the discoverability of your papers. Used by translation services also for foreign readers. Abstracts help readers decide whether or not to read more. Abstracts provide reminders for readers after they've read the article and abstracts provide um, signposts highlighting key aspects of articles. They direct readers' attention to highlights, key things to take away, key things to understand about particular studies. And generally speaking, of course, the abstract is a marker for the professionalism and overall integrity of the work as a whole. Abstracts then are not substitutes for the article itself and should not be cited on their own. They're not summaries of the entire article. They just present the main findings. If you want to know actually what's happening in the study, you're going to have to read the whole thing. But they do contain enough information for somebody else to understand what's happening. But they don't have all of the information for a critical evaluation of the research. And this is particularly important in medical research. As you can imagine, we do not want doctors, surgeons, 
medical practitioners reading just the abstract of a study and then going off and applying the work. We want those kinds of people, those professional medical practitioners, clinicians, to read the whole of papers and fully understand what is actually happening overall in a study. And keep in mind that abstracts, especially those published in conference proceedings volumes, are often not fully peer reviewed. Indeed, conference proceedings volumes, we've all attended academic conferences, we've all written articles for academic conferences, up to 60% of those articles may never get actually converted into a complete scientific article. So keep that in mind when looking at conference presentations. In terms of different types of abstracts, we are aware of descriptive ones, indicative ones, informative ones, structured ones, and presentation abstracts for meetings and posters. We've already talked, haven't we, about informative abstracts and structured abstracts. Indicative ones are the kinds that you find associated with review articles, and we'll talk more in a minute about presentations and posters. But if you're writing or editing an academic article, you have quantitative data, you have clear outcomes from the study, then you're going to be writing probably an informative abstract, maybe a structured informative abstract, as we've talked about already in this presentation. Let's review quickly what the differences are between these different types of abstracts. Of course, descriptive ones indicate the scope of the findings. They may contain little substantive information. They emphasize the report, not its contents. And often they're referred to by editors as PAP abstracts. Studies were undertaken, data were accumulated, some interesting observations were made, our conclusions are given. These are often avoided by editors when looking at papers potentially to send out for peer review. Here's an example. This report describes a brief 15 session couples group therapy format developed by a university affiliated human um, sexuality clinic for the simultaneous treatment of marital and sexual dysfunction. It just describes what's happening. It doesn't give you any results. It's not a quantitative outcome based study. Here's another example. You can have a look again, as we've mentioned, at these examples when you have this presentation, when you have the chance to review this webinar in your own time. I hope that they will help you with the putting together, the editing and the structuring in your own work. That's the goal, of course, of this webinar presentation today. In contrast, indicative abstracts, such as those that we find as the abstracts of review articles, state the objective, give a succinct summary of data sources, specify criteria used to select studies, describe guidelines used for abstracting data and assessing quality, and then give the reader the conclusions. Again, you can see the clear structure to these different kinds of abstracts yourself. And here is an example of an indicative abstract. Review the literature. We searched these databases, getting the review information out there, putting it into an abstract for study selection, in this case, data extraction. Again, the clear structure that we've talked about already is very, very important. Data collection comes before data analysis. What did you do? Why did you do it? How did you um, what results did you get and what conclusions did you come to at the end of the day? So indicative abstract selection and extraction. And here, in this case, in an informative abstract, we are going back and talking about the main kinds of abstracts that you would encounter in academic quantitative research. So the results State briefly the contents, follow the sequence that we've talked about, include information such as the species or population, study design or experimental approach, as well as any independent or dependent variables. So in that sequence that we've talked about already, 
this shape here again corresponds to that four question based technique for writing effective abstracts that we've talked about already some common errors that people make when putting their abstracts together can include inconsistencies between the text of the main paper and the abstract itself reporting data in the abstract that's actually not present in the main body text of the paper or both and you can see here some approximate percentages in our own editing work that we've used to identify these kinds of errors in abstract creation um, informative abstract creation so how to fix these issues very important to think about as an editor as an author check double check triple check the pieces of data in the abstract against the data in the body of the article, something that editors have to do an initial checking process. If somebody is providing a particular outcome for an experimental study in their abstract, you have to go into the body text of the paper to check that that's there in the main paper. As I've already mentioned, up to 50% of articles submitted to our journals tend to make this mistake. They write about something in the abstract that's then not present in the main body text of the paper. Other errors that people tend to make, no question, or the question is stated vaguely. It's unclear to the reader what the paper is actually going to be doing. Implications are stated instead of answers. You have to tell your readers what the answer is to the question that you're addressing in your paper. Maybe there's too much detail. Maybe the abstract is too long. Keep in mind that most journals, most international journals are looking for 200 to 250 words for the abstract section of the paper. So keep this in mind also when putting these together. Research papers tend to be informative in their abstract structure. Studies, experimental subjects, methods, results, and interpretation. Whereas medical case reports may be different. The patient, information about the patient, and then the unusual features of the case and actually writing a medical case report is quite different in some respects to writing an ordinary academic article abstract. If somebody listening to this presentation is interested in accessing the medical writing training that we provide at Top Edit, please do get in touch. We provide lots of webinars, lots of training, lots of other information about how to write, how to do it in English that we think you may find interesting. Don't hesitate to get in touch. Here we have some information, some examples of informative abstracts. We assessed to determine whether pulmonary venous flow and mitral inflow is less invasive. We prospectively studied, we correlated. Here you can see what was done and why in these abstracts. And then moving on in this same example, we found, we conclude, we suggest. These are linking phrases, question phrases that you can use in your English writing to flag to editors, to flag to readers where they are in the structure. We found, we conclude, we suggest. Take that four question basic structure that I gave you at the start of this presentation and apply it to your editing, apply it to your English writing. It really will help you to be more effective. Informative abstracts. Here's an example you can have a look at in your own time. See if you can identify where the different parts of the four questions are. They're in sequence. What did you do? How did you do it? What did you find? And what did you conclude? Don't worry about reading lots of text in this presentation. You'll get the presentation. You'll get the slides. You'll be able to have a look at these examples on your own time when you have to next potentially edit or write an abstract in 
English. I put on purpose quite a few examples into this presentation so that you would have lots of information. You would have lots of content. You would have lots of examples that you can use in your own work in the future. So when you listen back to this presentation, you might wish to pause the video on these slides. And have a think. Where are the four questions? Can I see the examples of the structure that Gareth is talking about when I look at these examples of informative abstracts. Structured abstracts, in contrast, as we've already discussed, are helping readers to quickly judge the findings of a study. They guide authors into better summaries, they aid reviewers, and of course, they also facilitate, make easier those electronic searches. We talked already about how you may wish to do this anyway in your own writing, in your own editing. And then if your journal is not asking for a structured abstract per se, you can always just delete that structure when you put the work together for submission. So here you may include headings. You may even use incomplete sentences, but follow those journal requirements, structured abstracts. And here you will have some more examples. Again, you can pause the presentation, have a look at how it's done. The background, the methods. In this particular example, dual chamber, arterioventricular and single chamber ventricular pacing. That's the background. And then what was done? We randomly assigned a total of 2010 patients. Pause it, have a look at how it's done, how the writing is put together, how authors create structured abstracts. Results, and conclusions in that sequence. It really will help you to be effective in your own writing and editing if you have a think about using some of these structures, some of these templates that we provide for effective academic writing. Now, another example, this one, the objective to identify predictors in medical schools that can be manipulated to affect the proportion of graduates entering generalistic practice. There, again, this is a medical study. It's a trial. So the objective followed by the design, equivalent, of course, to the methods in non-medical work, design and participants, followed by the independent variables and some discussion of the dependent variable. In this case, that's what this particular journal, the target journal in this case, is looking for in the structure of the abstracts that they want authors to submit to their outlet. Then come the results and the conclusion. Again, you can go back over this content. You can have a look at these examples. When you have the video recording of my beautiful voice shouting at you in English, and you can pause on these different sections and you can use them as templates for your own writing. Objective, design, animals, procedures. In this particular example, it's a veterinary study to determine the clinical features and outcomes in dogs and cats with OCD. Retrospective study, animals, 103 dogs, 23 cats, and procedures. Records of patients were analyzed for clinical features, medication, and so on. There is the example. You can see here come the results, and here come the conclusions and clinical relevance. Again, good examples for you to have a look at when you look and review the recording of this presentation. Presentations and meeting abstracts, finally then, talking about what you might put together at a conference. If you put an abstract together to attend a conference or a meeting, you're going to want to be comprehensive. You're going to want to strictly follow the format and content rules of your um, meeting, of your conference. You're often going to get more details of your methods into the abstract because, of course, there's nothing else for people to read other than this abstract, you're going to get implications in there and you're going to get published potentially in a conference proceedings volume. And this provides, of course, opportunity for feedback from others in the field. And keep in mind, as we've talked about, 
about up to 60% of conference abstracts never make it into full paper format. These are, of course, often written for conference participation before the main paper has been put together. Posters, in contrast, include illustrations, tables, and graphs. Get the images on there, get the illustrations on there. A picture is worth a thousand words. Keep the words to a minimum and consider these to be snapshots, billboards, advertisements for your work, ways to initiate a conversation. And of course, people form first impressions very quickly. They decide whether or not to read your poster in the first three seconds often of looking at it. Your font size is important. Get the text to a minimum and keep it large which is going to be easier for people to read from a distance of several meters. Imagine a crowded conference session, everybody walking around. People are going to be looking at your poster, your abstract from a distance. So you've got to make sure that they're going to be able to access it, that they're going to be able to read it easily. Let's now move on to the second half of our presentation today, and that's about English writing tips and tricks. How can you be effective, more effective in your English writing? And the first thing to say about English writing, just like writing in your native language, keep it short. As Shakespeare said, brevity, of course, is the soul of wit. Shorter sentences are more effective for your readers to understand your message. In English, writing, we ask, where is the distinctiveness? Where's the evidence? Keep it crisp, keep it short, because people lose interest. People are busy, people are doing lots of things, people have lots of academic articles to read. Did you know that almost two million academic papers get published every year? How can we possibly keep up to speed on all of them? You want people to be attracted to your work. You want people to think, where's the distinctiveness? You want to keep their interest rather than losing their interest. So concise and to the point. In English, short sentences, no unnecessary words. Use familiar words. Use good style. We can teach you good writing style, good punctuation. These are skills that can be learned. They're not talents, of course. You can learn how to be effective in your English writing. Keep it short, use familiar words, and we can teach you style and punctuation. Perhaps if you find this presentation to be interesting and informative, you would be interested in joining us for other training in the future. Scan my QR code, get in touch, happy to talk about any aspects of effective English. No single style fits everyone, no writing training fits to everybody, but you can learn key skills. Ask yourself, are you happy with the way you write? And as we've discussed already, good English is plain English. Keep it simple, that's the golden rule. And writers in business communication, which is where a lot of these training techniques come from, we just apply them to academic writing and editing, people share the same view. Plain English is at the heart of effective written communication. We are, of course, aware that there are differences and tricks and tips that you can learn to make your writing more effective. One good example, one area of common confusion, one area where authors tend to make mistakes in their writing in English is in the difference often between American and British English. Common differences in spelling, common differences in tenses. Are you aware, for example, of the different ways that American English versus British English use tenses, learned, has learned, she has learned about how to be an effective editor would be the American English way of writing, whereas she has learned about being an effective editor would be the British English way of writing. My personal favorite, 
Did you know that there's a spelling difference between the words gray and gray, depending on which spelling convention you use? One of the most common mistakes that authors make in their writing is to not check the guidelines of their journal before starting to write and using inconsistent spelling conventions. So they might mix American and British English in the same paper. Lots of journals ask you for a particular style. Check those guidelines. Lots of journals don't specify a particular style, but they will say be consistent and editors will catch these kinds of differences when they work on your papers. Common mistakes in English, how to find them and correct them. And we ask ourselves often at Top Edit, what are the most common mistakes that our editors encounter? Here are some of the most common mistakes that our editors encounter. You can learn about these mistakes. You can avoid them in your own writing. The pronoun referent, we'll come to that in a minute. Who versus whom, the use of lay versus lie, and the use of transition words in English language writing. Let's dive in. Let's have a look at some of these differences in this section of the presentation. People often make mistakes also around the pluralization or not of nouns, the use of commas, the use of contractions, its versus it's with that apostrophe in there indicating a contraction and the use of common words that sound very similar to each other, but actually have quite different meanings. Effect and effect is one good example. So there's eight examples of common mistakes. Let's look first at pronoun reference. Pronouns, of course, in English writing are used to substitute the name of a noun in the sentence to avoid repetition of that noun. So for example, my brother was obese when he was younger because of the food choices at home. In this sentence, the pronoun he should be used instead of she, as of course the sentence refers to the noun brother. Lots of languages don't have gender differences. Lots of languages this is not an issue, but in English the pronoun referent and getting it correct is important. And this is a common mistake that we encounter in our editing work. James was with his mother when the accident happened. The woman was found bathing in her own blood. Jenny is wearing a beautiful diamond necklace, a gift from her husband, James. Those are the pronoun gender specific pronoun reference. Important to keep this in mind in your own writing, important to keep this in mind in your own editing work as well, because these are very common mistakes that authors tend to make. Let's look at who versus whom, these words that are used in adjective clauses. Who, of course, is the subject of an adjective clause, whereas whom is used as the object. Confused about what that means? Let's have a look at some examples. The man whom gave me the proposal was my senior. Is that correct or not? Often, the easiest way to tell as an editor is to ask yourself, does it sound correct? And I know that's difficult when English is not your first language, but with practice, it will come. The adjective in this case should be who instead of whom, as it's the subject of the clause in this particular case. The woman who is wearing a black suit is a killer. The woman whom we talk to is a killer. Whom did you step on? Getting those who versus whom adjective uses correct in your sentences is important. Common mistakes that authors make when writing in English. Number three is lay and lie. Lay, of course, is a transitive verb that needs to have an object after it. It needs someone or something to receive an action, whereas lie is an intransitive verb. It doesn't need an object. It can stand alone. That's the big difference between these two very similar sounding words. So, for example, I lay the book on the counter. The country lies between different mountain ranges. Andrew lays his bag on the table. I hope you can see the difference. I hope you can experience the difference in these two cases. 
transition words then as well. And we've already looked at transition words in this presentation in the context of abstract writing. In summary, in conclusion, results show. In contrast, moreover, alternatively, also, on the other hand, because these words link one idea with another one. These words are also used to show relationships within paragraphs. Very important in English writing and very often people don't use them correctly. As an editor, it's going to be important for you to find and correct these common mistakes and differences in the English writing of our colleagues. Be concise to the point, as we've already talked about, short sentences, no unnecessary words, keep it familiar, watch your style and watch your punctuation. Transition words, they give people those linking sentences. They say that health is wealth. Hence, it is important to eat the right kind of food and exercise. Where's the transition word in that sentence pair? Of course, it's hence. Hence shows the reason and links it back to the prior idea. Health is wealth. Hence, hence, it's important to eat the right kinds of food. Vegetables are good for one's health. Additionally, fruits that are rich in vitamins and minerals can also keep us healthy. So there's the use of additionally as a transition word to link those two sentences together and provide a context to the subject of the clause. Vegetables are good for your health. Additionally, fruits can keep us healthy. That's how it works. So topic sentences are important in effective English writing. Here's a few examples. To be an effective CEO, a chief executive officer requires certain characteristics. Where's the topic? The topic, of course, is being an effective CEO. And the controlling idea in this case is certain characteristics. There are many possible contributing factors to global warming. That's the topic sentence topic is global warming. And the controlling idea in this example is contributing factors, of course. Topic sentence, fortune hunters encounter many difficulties when exploring a shipwreck. Where's the topic? Well, it's exploring a shipwreck. And the controlling idea is many difficulties. Finally, dogs make wonderful pets because they help you to live longer. Ask yourself the topic. The topic is dogs making wonderful pets. And the controlling idea in this example is, of course, that they help you to live longer. That's how it works. That's how you can use these techniques to make your writing more effective. Indeed, transition word errors often include <coughs> the fact that a singular subject has to take a singular verb, whereas a plural subject has to take a plural verb. Those are common problems that people encounter in English. And of course, the plural form of most nouns in English is created by simply adding the letter S. But, but words that end in ch, x, s, or s like sounds require an es for the plural. So keep this in mind as well. It's difficult to keep up with this, I know, but pluralization of nouns can provide our international colleagues with issues when writing in English. Box, boxes, boy, boys. Notice that the X there on the end of the word requires that ES to pluralize the noun. These are some examples. Again, you can have a look at this section of the presentation when you look at the recording. Help to identify these mistakes, find some of the issues that people have with their English. Commas. Another big one, a misplaced comma can change the meaning of a sentence because in some cases a comma can indicate contraction. Let's eat, grandma. Let's go and have something to eat, grandma. Whereas let's eat, grandma, um, suggests something quite different. The first sentence suggests that we're going to eat grandma, while the second sentence suggests an invitation. Use the comma properly. And this is, again, a mistake that's often encountered in English writing. We see also issues in punctuation, the use of colons and semicolons. Be aware of how these should be used. A colon is used when a list or explanation follows. A semicolon is used to separate two or more related clauses. And I give you again some examples 
here on this slide. A comma puts itself in a sentence to denote a pause between groups of words or indeed to separate sub clauses. And the best way, again, to make sure that you're using these punctuation marks correctly is, of course, to read out your sentences out loud and see if they make sense. It's versus it's. It's is an adjective where it, it is is a contraction of it's is the pulling apart of those two words. So it's a bluebird. It is a bluebird. Its wings are blue. It has blue wings. It's our neighbor's dog. These, again, are also issues often encountered in English writing. What about affect and effect? Affect and effect. Affect is a verb, whereas effect is a noun. The typhoon has affected a lot of cities in the south. Its effect can be found everywhere. The damage brought by the earthquake will affect the tourism in this town. These are difficult ones. And as an editor myself, I often change these words completely so that I don't get confused by the different meanings, the different pronunciations of these particular forms. Finally, then, we'll talk a little bit about some issues that international authors tend to have when writing and publishing in English, starting with plagiarism. This is a huge issue in the academic environment and beyond, and it refers to the use of information without crediting its source. And of course, this can seriously harm your credibility. If you make use of the words of others, you need to cite. Without citation, you will get caught by journal plagiarism checking software. Common forms of academic plagiarism then include mosaic, paraphrasing, and self-plagiarism. Mosaic plagiarism is taking data from a range of sources, mixing it together to make it seem original without citing those original sources. Paraphrasing plagiarism, even if your words differ, the original idea remains the same and plagiarism occurs. And the one that causes most confusion amongst international researchers, the idea of self-plagiarism. Even if you use something from one of your own published papers, you nevertheless have to cite yourself. It is best practice to cite your own previous work thoroughly, even if you're simply revisiting an old idea or previously published observation. You may not own copyright of your figures published in previous pieces of work. So bulletproof your work. Make sure that inadvertent plagiarism does not happen. You read something. I do it too. In a second language, you think it sounds great, and then you end up using it in your own writing. You can avail yourself through our services, perhaps, to get your documents checked by a plagiarism checking piece of software, the same software packages, by the way, that the big international journals, publishing companies use, make sure that you are down there below 10% as a plagiarism check. If you are above 10%, the chances are your journal, your publisher will flag your article will say that the information in your paper has been cited, has been taken from another source without appropriate citation. Here they are, software searches that look at already published literature in standard databases. And we have access to these at Top Edit, so you can come to us and we can check your documents to make sure that they're going to get through the check that international journals will make on your work. So let's recap what we've talked about in our presentation today. We've talked about two things, the structure of an effective English abstract. And I've given you lots of examples of the different kinds of abstracts that you will encounter as an author and as an editor. And we've also talked some English writing tips and tricks briefly. If you find any of this information particularly useful or interesting or informative and you would like to learn more, perhaps we can provide additional training for you in the future, then please do get in touch with me, get in touch with us, and we will be happy to provide you with more information, more 
training more um, content that will help you to be better and more effective as an editor, as a researcher, and as an English writer. Remember, above all, it's the structure that we need to see as editors, as readers, as authors, to make it easier for us to understand what's happening in a particular article. As Alfred Hitchcock used to like to say, to make a great film, you need three things, the script, the script, and the script. Structure, structure, structure. That's what's going to make your job easier. That's what's going to help you to be more effective as a writer, publishing and reviewing your own work. So thank you so much for listening. I'm very happy to have had the opportunity to do this presentation today. My name is Gareth Dyke. Here I am back on the screen here at the end of the presentation. Now is your chance to ask any questions, any comments, any feedback that you have on this presentation. We will happily answer any of your questions now in the question session. Thank you once again for listening. And I certainly do look forward to seeing you again in our next presentation. Gareth Dyke is my name. Top Edit Author Services is the name of our company. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.